Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, yesterday I checked out the new GeForce GTX 1650 for the first time, and I was very disappointed with what I found. For some time now, AMD's Radeon RX 570 has been, or at least should have been, the go-to option for budget-conscious gamers. It absolutely obliterates NVIDIA's GTX 1050 Ti, and it's been the cheaper of the two to buy ever since the cryptocurrency mining boom thing cooled off. So the Radeon RX 570 really is a great value gaming graphics card, but as great as it is, I was really hoping that we'd be getting a Turing-based GPU that was even better, especially having waited all these years. Sadly though, that didn't happen. The GTX 1650 struggles to ever match the value of the much faster RX 580. The only possible advantage the GTX 1650 has is its power efficiency. It might not be the fastest thing going around, but it does sip power, and using less power means cooler and quieter graphics cards, or at least it can. In this case though, I suspect it means bigger profit margins for AIB partners, as they can get away with slapping a crushed Coke can on the thing, and it'll still run at 70 degrees. Still, the GTX 1650 s that I've seen so far do run cool and quiet, despite their unimpressive looking coolers. The other advantage to not using much power is, well, not using much power. And that means the GTX 1650 doesn't require an external power connector. At least this one that I've purchased doesn't. Unfortunately though, the models provided by MSI and Gigabyte for review did require external 6-pin power connectors, and this does place them in direct competition with something like the cheaper and faster Radeon RX 570. So, with the help of our lovely Patreon backers, I have purchased the Gigabyte GTX 1650 OC. This one is 195mm long, so it's quite a short graphics card, and it weighs just 377 grams. So, extremely light for a graphics card. And yeah, I mean, you guys can see how small it is, and not a particularly large aluminium heatsink. But most crucially, the reason why I have purchased this graphics card is because it doesn't have an external PCI Express power connector. There's no six pin PCIe power connector on this card, as you can see. So it is limited to 75 watts. Anyway, for a bit of context, I suppose, we do have the, will that stand up for me? Not really. We do have the card I used in my day one 0.5 content. So that is the Gigabyte Gaming OC version. Now, this graphics card, as you can see, is significantly larger. It's much bigger. They're both dual slot cards, but this one's just longer and much heavier. It is something like 36% longer, and it is 76% heavier. So much more substantial cooler on this thing, and yeah, just a bigger, beefier card. But as you can see, it has a six pin connector, so it can run above the 75 watt spec. In terms of pricing, the smaller version without the 6-pin PCIe power connector costs $155 US, so that's only $5 over the MSRP. The Gaming OC version, though, that I used for my initial testing, that one costs $180 US and does require 6-pin PCIe power, so it's 16% more expensive. Out of the box, the base model targets a boost clock speed of 1710 MHz, while the bigger version aims for 1815 MHz. When gaming, the base model typically boosted to 1830 MHz, while the 6-pin model hit 1950 MHz, meaning it was clocking 7% higher, and that's a reasonably large difference. Because the base model is limited to the 75 watt power delivery of the PCI Express x 16 slot, it can't clock higher as it would be running out of spec, and doing so could risk damage to the motherboard. Therefore, out of the box, we saw a peak GPU load of 67 watts, whereas the gaming OC model hit 72 watts. Given the limitations, overclocking the base model isn't really possible. The card's power limit is locked to 100%, and at most, I was only able to squeeze another 15 megahertz out of the cores, and even that was a little iffy, pushing the GPU load to 69 watts. However, I quickly discovered the GTX 1650 is extremely memory bound. So if you spend the small power budget available on the 75 watt model by overclocking the four gigabytes of GDDR5 memory, this does lead to reasonably impressive gains. I was able to boost the memory frequency by 17%, and as you're about to see, that did lead to some fairly impressive performance gains. That said though, the six pin models overclocked much better, and again, we'll look at those results in a moment. Overclocked the GPU on the Gigabyte GTX 1650 Gaming OC, peaked at 91 watts, and averaged an operating frequency of 2070 megahertz, which it was really quite impressive. For testing, I have just a few games, and then the usual test system has been used, which includes a Core i9-1900K clocked at 5 gigahertz with 32 gigabytes of DDR4-3200 memory. Okay, let's get into the results. 
First up we have World War Z and here out of the box the performance between the two Gigabyte GTX 1650 models is basically identical which might seem a bit odd at first given the 6-pin model is clocked 6-7% to 7 higher. However, as I mentioned earlier, the GTX 1650 is very memory bound. So much so that you have to really underclock the core quite heavily before you see a noticeable decline in performance. Leaving the core frequency untouched but boosting the GDDR5 memory frequency by 18% improved frame rates in World War Z by 7%. Certainly not an amazing overclock from the base model, but I did try to overclock the cores and that only saw a 1-2% to increase. So overclocking the memory is certainly the way to go. The 6-pin model did support core and memory overclocking and the memory went a little further. This saw a 12% boost in performance, placing the GTX 1650 just behind a stock GTX 1063GB. Not exactly an impressive result overall, but this is about the best you can hope for from a GTX 1650 and World War Z. Performance gains when testing with Far Cry New Dawn were quite similar. The base model was 7% faster once overclocked, while the 6-pin model was 14% faster. Again, another nice performance uplift for the 6-pin model, but even so, it was slower than a stock 3 gb 1060 and much slower than a stock Radeon RX 570. We know Forza Horizon 4 to be quite a memory sensitive title and therefore I wasn't overly surprised to see the memory overclock on the base model providing a 13% performance boost which was comparable to the 15% performance boost of the 6 pin model. Gains seen in Fortnite are reminiscent of what we just saw in World War Z and Far Cry New Dawn, an 8% boost for the base model and 13% for the 6 pin version. Then finally we have Resident Evil 2 and here we see a slight performance advantage out of the box for the 6 pin model and then once overclocked it enjoyed a 17% performance bump and then 10% for the base model. Well I have to admit I am pleasantly surprised by this 75 watt model, the version that lacks the 6 pin PCI Express power connector. Uh, I had thought it would be worse than it was but yeah I mean it's not a particularly good graphics card but like I said I was expecting it to be worse than it was so that is noticeably worse than this card, but yeah, didn't turn out to be the case. To be fair though, this is the best or one of the best 75 watt models you can get your hands on. It is running right on the edge there, right up to the edge of the power limit, so there's just absolutely no headroom there for the cores. Though, it is only clocked something like 3% above the uh, official NVIDIA spec, so it's not like the really base base models are going to be a whole lot slower. So. Yeah, I think it's fair to say you can buy any 1650 and get pretty similar performance to what we showed in our day 1.5 review. So the takeaway here is, if you're after a GTX 1650, and let's not get into reasons, if you're after a GTX 1650, then your best bet is a base model at or as close to the MSRP as you can get. In my opinion, the Gigabyte Gaming OC is a much better graphics card than the base model OC version, but it's certainly not worth paying more than a $10 premium for, so at around $30 more, it is a hard pass. Of course, it is my opinion that the GTX 1650 series in itself is a hard pass, because for $20 less, you can get an RX 570, which is overall a faster graphics card, and in most modern titles, much faster, think something like 20%. And yeah, the RX 570, it does suck down way more power, which certainly isn't ideal, but base model RX 570 is way around 700 grams, so they're still quite cool and quiet. But getting back to the GTX 1650, if you're a mad scientist that would overclock a gaming chair, then there's more fun to be had with the 6-pin models, and you can get them for as little as $160 US. And I say that relative to the MSRP, so that's just $10 over the MSRP. So I guess in an alternative universe where the GTX 1650 is actually worth buying, I'd buy one of these models. I'd spend a little bit more to get a 6-pin power connector, because yeah, you can have a bit more fun overclocking it. So that brings me to the end of this video, but don't despair, I've got more GTX 1650 content planned. Yay, says everybody. <laughs> no, but seriously, I do want to look into this whole PCIe power cable debate. A shocking number of people are arguing that the GTX 1650 is worthwhile and that it's even a great graphics card because models such as this one don't require external power. They can be used in cheap OEM systems because of that and it just makes them sort of a cost-effective upgrade, at least that is the argument. Thing is, I can't really find those systems, at least ones that would warrant throwing in a $150 US graphics card. So if you guys can please post some candidate systems below in the comments, that'd be really helpful. The more information, the better, and I'll look into buying those PCs, or at least seeing how viable they are, or how viable this is as an upgrade for those PCs.
I've already discussed this with our Patreon community on Discord, and they seem to think the whole PCIe power cableless thing is a bit of a crock these days. One member dug up the Dell Precision T1600 workstation with a Core i7-2600 processor, and yeah, the power supply doesn't have a 6-pin PCIe power connector, and there doesn't appear to be any spare 4-pin Molex cables to use with an adapter. Thing is though, with very, very basic PC building skills, you can remove that dumpster fire of a PSU within like 5 minutes, and then replace it with a quality 450 to 500 watt model for around $35 US, throw in an RX 570, and yeah, you've spent $15 more than a GTX 1650, but you've got a significantly better gaming graphics card that will no doubt age considerably better. And since you're obviously a bit of a tired ass, that'll mean big points for the Radeon GPU. Anyway, I think that will do it for this one. I would like to just quickly note that I did buy this Gigabyte graphics card and I have nothing against Gigabyte, so I, I hate to use them in this sort of negative-ish content. I mean, it's not super negative, but I just don't see a point to these graphics cards. And yeah, until I can prove that they do have a point, um, yeah, I'm gonna stick to my opinion. Frankly, at $150 US, these are mainstream graphics cards meant for mainstream gaming, and that doesn't mean people using 10-year-old computers. But anyway, apparently it does, so we will look into that in a separate uh, piece of content. But I would like to just say thank you to Gigabyte for providing this card and the, the GTX 1660, which was a fantastic product. The 1660 Ti, also fantastic. And the RTX 2060, also quite a fantastic product. And Gigabyte 1660 cards uh, were the best value options I found. They provided dual fan cards at pretty much MSRP prices, whereas competitors such as ASUS and maybe even MSI didn't. Uh, and this particular model was better than the MSI Gaming X in terms of operating temperature, uh, operating volume and all that sort of stuff uh, and overclocked a little bit better as well. So yeah, hate to throw Gigabyte in the firing line on this one if I have. Uh, appreciate them sending out cards, and yeah, they do make quality cards, they just can't do too much about the GTX 1650 kind of sucking in terms of cost per frame. And well, that's something else I'll discuss in an upcoming video as well. I really want to do a replying to comments uh, episode on my review of the 1650 because there's some absolute pearlers there that I would like to address. But anyway, we'll do that in a separate video uh, soon because yeah, I haven't done a reply to comments for a while, and I think, yeah, we've got plenty of material to work with in our 1650 review. But anyway, apologies to Gigabyte if required. And yeah, I think that's probably all I need to say. But anyway, if you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content. And if you appreciate the work we do at Haran Box where we buy graphics cards, actual retail cards, so we can see what's going on in different situations, then yeah, you can support us on Patreon because that allows us to do that. And you also get some really awesome perks, like you become a member of our really cool Discord community, you get to see our live streams, behind the scene videos, and yeah, some other cool stuff. Anyway, thank you for watching. I am your host, Steve, and I will see you again next time. Meh.